Welcome to The Sensitive Warrior, where feeling everything is your superpower. Join me as we dive into an uplifting and interesting podcast that celebrates the unique strengths of highly sensitive people. Hi, I'm Doreen Lang. I am author of Embracing Venus, Achieve a Life Lit Up for Highly Sensitive People. This is the cover of my book. I'm also a coach that helps people, sensitive people, thrive. I'm excited to welcome my guest today. I'm very excited. His name is Tony LaGreca, and he is a living legend doing very important work. And he will talk about his work, as well as I just recently learned that Tony is a highly sensitive person. So a lot to discuss. Uh, let's dive in. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Dory. Yeah, I'm so glad you came in. I know you're busy. You have your own show. Um, and I'd love for people to hear about that. So do you mind kind of talking about sure. where, how that came about and what you're doing now? Well, a few years ago, I bought a radio station, uh, WMEX 1510 AM in Boston. And <clears throat> we all has to have a, an app, WMEX Boston app, uh, so people can listen anywhere. Um, the reason why I'm, um, I have the show is in 2014, my son died of an overdose. And at the time, and after I investigated everything, I realized that I was a parent who didn't understand what was going on. So uh, when I say that, um, he got a prescription for an opioid, and I actually, I filled the prescription because he was injured from a football injury. And at the time, I did not, I never heard of the word opioid, never heard of the word oxycodone or oxycontin. And that was um, back around 2000. So um, I wanted to make sure that, that other parents could understand better about the opioid epidemic. And, and it could happen to anybody. It doesn't matter whether you're red or blue or, you know, yellow, black, or white. It doesn't matter, you know. So, and um, I thought the information was important. So I started the show called Courage to Hope. And in the show, I found, um, I have interviewed several different people, have all different aspects of, of um, addiction, grief, what are we doing about it, um, how do we get the word out, uh, everything in that general subject, you know, that involved. I mean, the, <clears throat> the Sackler family, which is the owner of Purdue Pharma, were the ones that really kicked off this epidemic by telling everybody that opioids was the cure-all. You know, Americans have too much pain. We can take care of all the pain. Mm. Just take our pills. And that's and, and approximately one in three people get seriously addicted to it. And it's very hard to get off of the addiction. And is that what happened to your son? That's correct. Um, at the time, he was told he could never play football again because this is the one sport that he absolutely loved to do. He was a college player. Mm. And at the same time, you're telling him he can't do what he loves to do, and then you give him something that makes him high. So there was a All wrong. collision, the worst combination that could have happened. And he never looked back. He was addicted for 20 years before he passed away. Wow. A lot of in and out of rehabs everywhere. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And of course, that takes the whole family. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was a, it was a long run, and it's very difficult. And yeah. you make a lot of enemies on the way. And a lot of people don't understand it, which right. I didn't understand it. Right. And I'm trying to get everybody to understand that it's, it's actually a disease. You know, it's a way of getting your endorphins <clears throat> to act out, and it's called getting you high. But after, after a, a fear period of time, the people who are addicted after three or four months, they're not really getting high. What they're doing is trying to prevent from being dope sick because to get off the pills is very difficult. And it takes, it, it, rehab is good, but it takes a lot of, time and right now right. Uh, it most insurance companies and rehab facilities uh, don't don't give you that much time no. they send them back out on the street after two months or most of the time back in those days it was two weeks four weeks 
That's all you could take, and it was like ten thousand dollars a month if you wow. pay in for it. Wow! So, wow! Yeah. Well, first of all, I, again, I know I've shared this with you, but I'm just my heart just goes out, and I'm so sorry about all about what you who you lost and in your families the pain. That's a long time to be mourning, and and then and then look what you did, right? What did you do to to try to make sure that this doesn't happen to other people, or or have a support for other people? That's right. right. So that's your that's your courage to hope. That's correct. You know, so I just it's just an it's an awareness show, and it's a show that um, um, and you know, and I talk about people who um, who have become who are doing above and beyond. Um, mm -hmm. Like we're preparing right now for a grief conference in Framingham mm -hmm. at the Sheridan Hotel in October, and this is for parents who have lost a child through substance use and we approximately we have 175 um, participants who have signed up already wow and this is a three-day weekend it starts on friday and ends on sunday <clears throat> you can stay in the hotel or you can commute right and we have speakers coming in on dealing with grief and then breakout sessions and all that sort of thing and right it's quite a it's quite an operation we have probably 25 people helping to put it together. Wow, that's phenomenal. Yeah. That's phenomenal. You know, I, as you know, um, I, the work I try to do, your work is huge, right? It's national. And you're really affecting so many people and doing such important work. In my studio, the majority of people I see um, come in for Reiki or come in for coaching around highly sensitivity. Um, but I will tell you that the majority of them are um, prone to addiction and are struggling with it. Oh yeah, I, it's it's a big it's a big problem. It's a big problem, and I think what I've learned because again, re right, researching for my book as well as meeting with people, and I bet you maybe will agree with me is people. Some people have real tendencies. <clears throat> excuse me to to try the energy. Of the world is too much. Now this was different with your son. He was told something. He was you know struggling with the idea that he wasn't going to be able to play. I, I can't, we, I don't know if he was a highly sensitive person, but I will tell you that there's people, that I meet people that are highly sensitive that they, they get so disappointed or they, are, they don't have the tools to help them feel better or they are, uh, the energy of the world is just too much and they go to alcohol or they go to drugs or they go to, over, they overeat. And I see a lot of people that are very overweight because they're just trying to find a way to reduce their overwhelming feelings oh yeah I, I know the, <clears throat> the the situation with food <laughs> I struggle with it all the time <laughs> I know that issue I am um, but no my son was very sensitive and he was a lover of animals and mm. and the underdog kind of thing and he um, um, I mean he would stop on the expressway if he saw a cat in the middle of the mm -hmm. the median strip and Sweetheart. And rescue the cat, you know, so. Yeah. And um, of course, uh, he gets some of that from me. I, I always break for turtles. You do? Yeah. <laughs> so I picked off a lot of turtles off, you know, if anybody sees uh, Lucy at the South Shore, <laughs> South Shore Science Museum, the big box turtle. Yeah. I picked her up when she was that size. Oh, is that right? I thought it looked like a little rock moving in the street. And, and you rescued her? And I brought her to the. And you named her? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is a true story. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. She's yeah. now 20 years old. Really? Yeah. 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 I know she was there, re you know, so three you or four years ago, but I haven't, <laughs> I haven't been back to been visit. Been back to see her. You know, it's interesting. You know, we could laugh about this, but you know, not everybody will stop and pick up a turtle. Yeah. Some of them actually look for them <laughs> in their cars. <laughs> Yeah. So very, very different people. Oh, yeah. Well, I figure a life is a life no matter what. Life is you a know? life no matter what. A yeah. Life is a life yeah. No if life. something gets into my house that doesn't belong there, I, yeah. I catch it and throw it out the door. You throw it out the door, yeah. You know, yeah. Even, even bees, hornets, yeah. you know, things like that. I just figure it's, it's better, you know. And yeah. I, I um, caught a bat once, too, in the house. Did you? Yeah. That yeah. was... <laughs> that was a challenge. You got the, you got him out or her out. Yes. Yeah, it out. Safe yeah. to say it, right? Yeah. yeah. I got the bat out. It was. Um, I actually had to use a spaghetti strainer. 
<laughs> you clamp it on the wall. That was really then smart. Then you use a Is it with the, with the spaghetti surround with the, like those little those little fingers on it, or was it like a like a screen? It was like a, well, no, it had the little fingers, the but fingers. there was the screen, but the little holes. Oh, okay. So that I was able to slide a piece of cardboard up between. And you got them. Yeah, I got it and put it outside. That's so interesting. I wonder if, you know, I really wonder if that as an HSP, this is, I know we do this, but I wonder if other people do too. I always wonder, are other people doing this that are not HSPs? I asked this woman this weekend, she wanted to, she wanted to copy my book, and she said, you know, I'll even catch a spider in my kitchen. And even tiny as it is, and I will, I will make sure I get it out the door. I will not even kill a little sp spider. And then just this morning, and I was wrapping up on my kitchen counter, and there was a tiny, tiny, tiny little spider. So I got a napkin, and I just wet a little bit in the sink so I could actually pick it up. And I grabbed it, and I took the whole napkin, and I just put the whole napkin outside. So when I come home, there'll be the napkin there. But I was afraid if I, if I, any other way to get it, I would kill it. That's right. It was a, it was a, it was small than the dot of a. Pen, pencil, the, the eraser on a pencil, but yeah. it, to me it was <laughs> to me it was a life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm prone to let spiders hang around because they catch mosquitoes. Yeah, I love them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this one I just didn't like. It was too close to my tomatoes. So, but <laughs> oh. so, so tell me about you as an HSP. Do you think that you know? This is one of the reasons why you're so passionate about helping kids and helping families. Do you think it's because you, not only did this tragic, horrible thing happen to you and your family and your boy, but also because you know what people are going through? Oh yeah, that's a big pet. And I, grief, grief is really a difficult uh, thing for people to deal with. And we're all going to deal with it one time or another. Yeah, no for, one escapes that. Yeah, you can't, you know. And um, I, somebody, in one of my sessions told me once that if you know grief is is love with no place to go hmm. and if you have a lot of grief that means you had a lot of love with the person you lost and it's going like up that. against it's, I love that. Yeah. it's nothing there yeah. and it's um, and I, I, I try to comfort people that are having situations you know I I was a bereavement facilitator at Hope Floats in Kingston for about three years. Wow. So uh, <clears throat> different women and men came in to our group, and, and I, I understood since I lost my son, you know, it's a, it's a feeling that nobody knows unless, they're, they unless it's happened to them. them. Yeah. And it yeah. never goes away. No. It rearranges itself, hmm. but it never goes away. You know, it's always that hole in your heart, you know. I say good night to my son every night before I go to bed. Mm -hmm. So, and um, uh, I do that by, I have pitches on a thing we call his memory chest. Mm -hmm. All the things that, we, that he, we had that remind us of him, his clothes, some of his baseball uniform and a variety of, of things. Course, we of course. keep it all in the memory chest. Yeah. And then his pitches are on the top. And I believe he, I believe he, he hears you, I believe that, I believe that. Okay. Well, I'm not sure what to, what what it is, but I know there's energy there. Yeah. And that I energy is that. what I'm trying to preserve and, and keep uh, doing it. Yeah. yeah. He's listening. So. So how uh, do you help yourself? I mean, that's a lot to take on. You know, you're doing all for people, and I know. you're listening. And you know, I know as a person that's HSP, you definitely feel what other people feel, but to take. I, I go so far, and that's my, my, my personal challenge as an empath, is I take on. I have to guard myself when I know I'm taking it on. I have to sometimes almost I get a chill when the, the pain is coming too strong from getting on other people's emotions. But I don't know where you fall on that spectrum that I, I had shared with you about. You know, way over here, people have no empathy, and people here have so much empathy, they actually take on the, the energy or take on the feelings of other people. So when you're helping these grieving people, and they walk away, and they go home. How do you feel? How do you how do you handle all well, that you've all um, you feel? I, I usually I, I cope with it pretty good, and I practice meditation. I'm a member of a sangha group that meets every Sunday night, and we we do a thing the five mindfulness trainings, and I practice the mindful the mindfulness trainings in the sangha group, and that. That really helps, you know, to uh, 
to keep that. Thich Nhat Hanh is a, is a, was a famous Buddhist person, and, and he died recently, about two years ago. And um, but he's written about 90 books, and that's no exaggeration. He's written, you know, in one book that he wrote called Peace in Every Step, mm -hmm. and it's it's like little one-page chapters. Mm -hmm. And um, back 10 feet even before my son passed away, I would, I would um, buy these books. And when I talked to people in airport lounges and a variety of places, I'd hand, a, hand them the book, you know, and so on. So you were, you were looking and studying this before all this happened? Oh, I've been doing it for over 30 years. Wow. So this, yeah. is, this has always been who you are. That's correct. This didn't just propel you into this movement. No, no, I, it's, I, I was doing that, you know, and so it was very hard <clears throat> for myself. I mean, mm -hmm. the first month after Matt died, that was my son's name, Matthew, um, I didn't want to get off the couch for, for a month, you know, and then I saw a therapist and he recommended that I take a look at Hope Floats and see about being, joining a, a group, you know, so... One thing led to another, and and um, I also did another group called GRASP, which stands for Grief Response After a Substance Passing. Wow. And that was in Brockton. I did that for well over a year. That was long enough. And from that point, um, I met, I actually got a message from a woman on the North Shore, Louise Griffin, and she had lost her son, and the... Um, she asked me if I would get a group of parents together that might want to be in the church scene in this movie. And, and it was a reenactment of a funeral. Oh. And um, in the movie, two boys, um, uh, friends, they're both pra playing around with drugs and both get addicted. Um, one ends up in rehab because his, because his mother sent him there, and the other one does a heroin um, overdose and dies. And we had to film the church scene. Mm. Um, wow. They were literally filmed it 15 times. How was that for you? It was hard for everybody. So the thing is, they had thought maybe 50 people would show up for this church scene. And Jim Wahlberg was the director of the film and the producer, and it turned out that 200 people showed up in a blizzard. We were having a major snowstorm that day. This was the no, time when we had- going to keep them away. No, and they were, and Jim Wahlberg was quite surprised at how many people- they Showed up. Showed up to do this church scene. And um, at the end of the movie, we had uh, pictures about this size, uh, probably nine by 12 picture, of, the loved ones that we've lost, and well, he, he took stills of the parents at the end, and that's how the at the end of the movie. It's very compelling and very, very compelling, deep. Very compelling, very deep. And I ended up talking to him, and next thing I knew, I was doing going to high schools with him, and we were doing showing the film to high school kids, and then talking about it after. That's brilliant. And um, cool. It got to the point where we were doing it with the DEA, wow. and we had um, high schools from all over the area would come in. We were at the Sangha Center, and we had 7,000 students come in, bussing them all in. Wow. And then we would also had entertainment and other things, but the whole deal was to, again, make awareness. And then we did um, the um, Verizon Center in Manchester, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And we were on closed circuit in all the schools in New Hampshire. Um, Governor Sununu set this whole thing up. It was pretty intense. And we had almost 10,000 people at that one. That's and we had major sports people who got addicted and telling their story and a couple of rappers to keep the kids kind of making sure that they were enjoying themselves. Right. But um, uh, Jim Wahlberg asked the kids a question, how many of you know somebody who have either died or overdosed or who's addicted? And out of the 10,000 people, 80% of them stood up 
And this was junior high and high school. Heartbreaking. Yeah. So we just to give you an idea the the yeah. the scope Reached. of the right. of the whole problem. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, we have literally right now we have millions of people in the, across the country who are addicted to some type of opioid. You know, and now we have fentanyl mixed in the deal. And there's so many um, artificial pills on the street that are laced with fentanyl. And that's... It's another, another way people are passing away. Right, and people need to know that fent it, it hit fentanyl... Our last like, year. It's, it hit our family last year. Yeah. You may think you could do, you know, they think they're doing a 10 milligram oxycodone and they're doing a Nope. pill that's laced with fentanyl and it's, it. right. and it's a hundred times stronger than what they're used to and their body just, their heart just stops. Just like that. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. people wonder why why the drug dealers want to kill this, their clients. Um, right. Um, a lot of people think of that, but but the fact that lot of, uh, a lot of addicts search for fentanyl because it's more potent and they think that it's going to get them a better high and it's going to Correct. make it more doable. Did you follow the um, on Friends, the um, actor? Oh, sure. Yeah. I knew that and, you know. Yeah, yeah you knew what was coming on that. Oh, yeah. 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 You could see as he was going along, even in the shows, he was, when he changed and got so thin all of a sudden. And, and no, you know. No. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people like wow. Prince. You know, uh, yeah. Michael Jackson, um, yeah. the woman, the woman from uh, Princess, whatever her name was, in Star Wars. Uh, oh, I didn't know about her. Yeah, she she overdosed actually on a plane. You know, before that, before it landed, she was wow. You know, and her heart. You stopped. must just, you must be so so educated now. You just must just know when you meet someone. I bet you just now know. you can tell when you read the obituary. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody recently died in Duxbury, and and it said, you know, donate little flowers, donate money to the Heron Project. Yeah. Well, the Heron Project is an awareness of over of, of you know, so. So Tony, what are you, you're doing? So much work in this, so much important work, um, and it's hard, but it's so important. What are you excited about now? What is it? What are you do? What are you working on that you're you're looking forward to? I know the this 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 uh, three day conference in Framingham. Yes, um, I have a person that's came, that I interviewed on my show. Uh, his name was Marshall Lane. Mm -hmm. Still is. He's alive and well. Mm -hmm. uh, Marshall's a very interesting guy. He was he was ten years in in um, in prison, and when he got out, he started a program called From Prison to Prosperity, mm -hmm. because it's so hard once you get out of prison to. No. You know, you can't ever pass a Corey test, so you never can get an apartment. You can't get yeah, how do they, how do they jobs. Do they People don't continue. hire you. It's yeah. a problem. So he started this company, <clears throat> and I got to talking to him, and he told me he was going to do a thing called the 366 Project. And because this was a, this is a leap year, that's 366 days. Mm -hmm. So that's... I said, so what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm going to give up my apartment, going to give up my vehicle, going to leave my job, and, I, and, and I'm going to go homeless for a year. And he said, I'm going to, and the first place he went was mass and cash, and he lived in a little tent there, and he was hanging out with all the, the homeless people and people who, and then he went on his bicycle and, he stayed in Norwood, then he moved down to Brockton, up to Worcester, Springfield. He been, he's been all over the state, sleeping in a tent in the woods. And um, he's, I, the that's, last that's I knew, he was, in, yeah. <clears throat> he was up in the Lawrence Lowell area, right. and sleep. You know, and he's had experiences. So I talked with Jim Wahlberg, and we're going to do a we're going to do a film about him on on him. And, um, and to let people know that's really what it's like. I mean, he's going to, he's been involved with, um, right. you know, going into places, you know, during the day to take to get a shower or to right. homeless centers and and how he ends up getting food and 
It, but the most important thing is the people he's been meeting. Uh, a lot of the people he's been meeting and don't want to have a house. They want to stay homeless. They can't deal with living. It's a lot of mental illness. Yep. And mental yep. illness and addiction yep. kind of yep. kind of partner up sometimes with people. They do. Well, one of my clients, <clears throat> her son, she meets him in Weymouth at a park every couple of months just to sit with him for a little while. And then he goes back in the woods. Breaks yeah. her heart. He does not want to come home. He wants that life. And she she comes to me for Reiki and she comes to talk, you know, coaching him because she's, she's a highly sensitive person. So he doesn't want it. She's trying to make a life for him however he wants it on his terms and he does not want to come home yeah and i know several people yeah. like that now it's really and interesting I, and i think we should yeah put this on film and let people understand let people understand what's what's happening in the world and i agree and how how it's too hard too stressful for certain people to paying that rent every month or paying the mortgage and you know yeah. Uh, what what they have to go through, you know, it's like a... It's a I, world they have no idea, and they have to see something like this to really see it. Oh, yeah. yeah and, you hear about you hear about these things, you hear about it, but unless you, like, right, walk a mile in their moccasins or at least see it with their own eyes, yeah, you know, it's just talk, right? It's just talk. Yeah, it but is. But you yeah. are doing really, really important work. I mean, you're the one that has continually asking, inquiring. You've been on this mission for how long now? Since 2012. 14. 14. Yeah, that's when I started with the... Wow. Yeah, so I am. And the other thing is that we do have a, a movie, a docu-series called Out, Out of Ashes, Out of the Ashes. And um, that'll be televised on Channel 5 in Boston, uh -huh. Channel 9 in Manchester. Uh -huh. it's, it's actually on ABC across the country. Um, I wish, I'd like to be able to give you the time but um, that's okay. People can look that up out of the ashes. Yeah, there's that's a lot pretty... of movies by that name too. Okay, so but th th this is about about people who parents who have gone on and done something. If actually, what it is is the uh, Jim Wahlberg went back to the people who were originally in um, If Only, and what are they doing now, kind of thing. Oh, people love that. People love so, following up with people. Yeah, so he, he, I'm in it because he followed up with me. Mm -hmm. And that's, so uh, there's a part, of, part in there with myself and my other son uh, who was also on the journey with me because a lot of parents who lose children also have other children. That's right. And so you've got to, you know, how, how does that affect the rest of the family? Because it does so deeply. And that's, that's very important. You know, we, we, we need to not lose sight of the living ones. You know, you need to continue with that. So how can people get a hold of you to learn more about how they can learn how to help themselves with this process, with this grief? And maybe they're highly sensitive people that are looking for help because this is the avenue they're going and they want they want out. So how do yeah. people get a hold of you? Um, they can go to the WMEX website. Mm -hmm. And that's WMEX, just like it sounds. Mm -hmm. And it's WMEXBoston.com. Okay. Or they can just go to Tony at wmexboston.com. Excellent. And that's, that's my email address. Thank you so much. Very simple. Thank you very much for coming on okay. and sharing your, your story so candidly. I really appreciate it. I'm sure right. it helped a lot of people. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. If, um, if you are ready to embrace your sensitivity and create change, um, let's connect. Reach out to me. My name is Doreen Lang. And again, you can reach me at Doreen at BlossomHealingStudio.com. Until next time, remember... Feeling everything is your superpower. It's just up to how you're going to embrace it. So thank you so much for joining us. And next week, we have a very special guest. Stay tuned. Thank you.